this is my land, this is your land, it belongs to all of us. Maine public lands are an incredibly important part of Maine's outdoor tradition. It's really part of who we are as Mainers. The lands are so diverse and so unique and so special that it's really an untold secret. The more we can connect people to the outdoors and connect people to nature, the healthier we'll be as a society. We're an agency that manages over a half million acres of land in Maine. That land consists of state parks, and it also consists of our public lands, which are some of the most iconic places in Maine. Maine public lands encompasses approximately a little over 600,000 acres in the state. They are lands that are managed for multiple uses. You have such a wide array of public land experiences. You have the western mountains, the northern region, and the beautiful rugged main coast. You have uh, ice fishing, snowmobiling in the wintertime. The spring, a lot of the, the fishermen are out in the, the peak season for fishing. You get into the summer, a lot more people are hiking and camping. And then in the fall, that's the primary hunting season. There are peak times through any season. It's a year-round adventure. The seasons are, are a gift in that there's so much diversity. On an already diverse landscape, it just multiplies it. We have a huge range of opportunities, and they can be quick, they can be easy, and they can be some of the most remote, rugged, wilderness, multi-day adventures you can have in the state. We offer several hundred campsites uh, on public lands, all open to the public. They're all free for the public to use. We have hundreds of miles of hiking trail. Really, it's a, it's a wide array of recreational opportunities. We also have areas where we have mountain biking trails, ATV trails, and snowshoeing as well. Bigelow Preserve is an incredible opportunity there for people who love both day outings and longer trips. You've got the Appalachian Trail that are up on the, the mountain, and it's a fabulous mountain with just incredible scenery, unique plant species, really just phenomenal windswept open environment at the summits. The Moosehead region is well known for its fishing, hunting, and wildlife watching opportunities. Color is one of our premier gems. I think it's really just such a phenomenal opportunity that it got preserved and that we are able to manage it, really showcasing a unspoiled piece of the main coast. Geologically, it's very rugged with cliffs and incredible dynamism of the cold water and the climate and the frequent fog and the maritime forest, and it's, it's just hauntingly beautiful. Darnell, I still maintain that's probably got one of the nicest, if not the nicest, freshwater beach in Maine. Dabuli is the most heavily used township within the entire North Maine woods, and its draw is native trout ponds. Never stocked, they're very productive. I think we've protected all the uniqueness of Dabuli. I think part of our mission in the Bureau of Parks and Lands is to just get people outside. You know, I grew up as a city kid uh, a long time ago. 
for me, being outside literally changed the course of my life. And so I want kids, whether they're in Portland or Lewiston or you know, Ashland or Fort Kent, to be able to be connected to the outdoors. We are managing it, but it's the public's land and the public has a really important voice in how that land should be managed. There's a lot of planning that's involved there and we really need to hear from the public, adjacent landowners, uh, interest groups, really anyone who has a stake, which is the state of Maine and frankly beyond. So there's, there's a lot of relationship management that happens and it's kind of like one big small town. And that's a really nice thing as far as working together, getting along, um, trying to be responsive to both the resource and to the public and finding balance there. So there's a lot of formal and even informal relationships. On the recreation side, I know a lot of our recreation rangers spend a good amount of time listening to the public at their campsite, talking to them, asking how their experience was, how could it be better. Major considerations when looking at public land are first and foremost is the ecological sensitivity of any public lands. Alongside that is wildlife considerations. And then what sort of recreational opportunities exist for the public and timber management considerations as well. And we look at the land base itself, and, and ultimately it's the land base that dictates what the best management is. So we take our most sensitive resources, areas like you know, alpine habitats or, or bogs and fens or floodplain forests. Those are called special protection areas, and they're essentially hands off. I'm an ecologist by training, so this part is really important to me and, and hits home. On our public lands, we have about 100,000 acres of ecological reserves. The ecological reserves provide a place where essentially nature is doing the management. Uh, trees are allowed to grow old and mature and die and, and create really valuable wildlife habitat for a number of species that don't necessarily thrive on managed lands. And they can also serve as, as essentially a, a benchmark for monitoring how forests change over time. Ecological reserves act as a sponge to collect carbon or store carbon from the atmosphere, which can be a great way to, to help mitigate climate change. So when we acquire a new piece of land, it's often done in concert with a, a conservation organization like the Forest Society of Maine. One way that I like to think about it is that if you love what we have now, our big forested tracks, our rivers, and the ability to go and be in them, the easements and working with the state, both for the easements and public lands, holds on to what we have now. And if we don't do this, we can't be sure that these assets, these opportunities, and these features are going to be there in the future. Wildlife really isn't that much different than we are as humans. They, they need shelter, they need food. That's what we continually try to provide for a wide range of species. We can move certain habitats in ways that will better suit wildlife that has critical habitat needs. Every fish and wildlife species has slightly different habitat requirements, where they get food, shelter, where they reproduce, whether they're species that require extremely dense softwood cover during parts of their life cycle, or they're species that require um, young, regenerating, intolerant hardwood forests. We can create those habitat conditions through management and through working with foresters on the landscape. Really great example of that are deer wintering areas. And so we work with foresters to ensure that those deer wintering areas that occur on public lands are managed 
effectively. One of the priorities for wildlife is creating lynx habitat. So we have a habitat management area that covers a little over 22,000 acres where um, the goal is to create a, a pre-established amount of actual snowshoe hare habitat, which is one of the preferred prey items of Canada lynx here. I've been working with the foresters on the ground to sort of plan that into the future. It's a multi-year process and we have an end goal date to create that habitat. To one of the very, very important aspects of what we do is timber management. That's what pays the bills and growing trees is a long-term proposition and so you have to have that long view, which as a forester has come sick in nature. And a lot of times our management is really mimicking mother nature and, and some of her pattern on how the forest is man managed naturally. A lot of what we do is small openings and a light touch. You can actually use timber harvesting wisely to improve the overall health and quality of the forest. So it can have um, ecological benefits and it can have economic benefits. And perhaps most importantly, the timber revenue that we generate from harvesting on public lands provides for a, a whole array of recreational benefits. We are self-funded through the harvesting of timber on public lands. Also certified under both FSC and SFI certification systems. Harvesting of timber, if done correctly, will actually increase the growth of the forest. It makes it much healthier forest. I explain it to a lot of people, it's kind of like weeding the garden. You're creating more space for the more valuable trees to grow. Forests are not static uh, in nature. They do not stay the same way if left alone with certain management techniques, we can actually create a forest that is healthier than if it had been left alone. I wouldn't be afraid to take on any job with the guys that I work with because they're tough and they can take the cold. It's nice to work for a company that cares about the future of the forest, and also the wildlife in the forest, good group of people. They want it to look pleasing when you look into the forest, but we can also cut some of it too and we can put people to work. That's important to me. We take periodic inventories in which we sample the forest to see what types of trees we have, their sizes, their species, their products. And part of what my job is, is to figure out what kind of species mix we want to have in the future. We also are quite low impact. We, we utilize a lot of harvesting technology that are uh, machines that do not impact the land itself. A method that we use is called cut to length, where we have a, a processor and a forwarder, two machines, where all the, the material is left in the trail to help cushion the trail and to reduce damage to root and soil compaction. We have a prescription process where a forester will take note and do a walkthrough of the entire area. The forester determines what is necessary in each one of those stands to increase the growth and the vitality of those areas. A lot of things happen before you even set foot on the ground. We have this base knowledge that a forester uh, really look at before going on the ground. So he already has a pretty good feel about what he's going to find out there. When you go out there, you try to find, okay, what's out here that, that, that's missing? Because of the way that crown breaks apart, it's only probably 24 feet of pulp. The status of the forest and the stage that it's in will dictate pretty much our action. Our public lands have hundreds of campsites. Many of those are accessed by water or trail. There's a lot of them that are also accessible by vehicle. 
And that's a, a big responsibility, a big job of working to keep those sites attractive and maintained. We have an array of trails, whether motorized ATV and snowmobile trails, which typically our public lands are providing important links with trail systems that go on private land for our motorized trails. A lot of the staff work closely together, mostly based on what their individual expertise is. So you might have forestry staff consulting with recreational staff when they're performing any timber management so that we're sensitive to the other uses that are involved in a given area. It really provides for a well-rounded group of staff that can really look at all angles of the management of these, these lands. The common thread of people working at public lands is that they have a real deep affinity for the outdoors, but everybody sees the value and the importance of something bigger than themselves and working to share that with the larger public, importance that we place on taking care of the resource, whether it's wildlife habitat, forest stewardship, clean water, clean air, all of those benefits that come from a healthy forest. And so there's a lot of really intrinsic motivation with our workforce. And it's one of those things that makes coming to work enjoyable. I very much enjoy working directly with foresters. I think I have a lot to learn from them. I think we learn a lot from each other. And spending time in the field with people who know the ins and outs of the landscape that we're on better than I do is, is always enjoyable. I learn something new every day. The variety and the complexity combined and the challenges are always there every day, but when you get up in the morning, you're facing a new challenge, which is, for me professionally, is pretty exciting. And the staff takes it very personal. I mean, they take ownership in what they're doing, and so they manage these lands just like they're their own lands. My position is kind of a dream job in that I get to work on all of Maine's forest types. I get to work with dedicated staff, knowledgeable staff who want to hear my opinions as I want to hear theirs. I also really like the part of my job where I get to interact with the public, really engaging them in what habitat management looks like and what wildlife management looks like. Here in the state of Maine, we really value these resources. I take very seriously that you know, I'm one of the wildlife biologists who's entrusted with those resources to manage them effectively. You know, one of the reasons I wanted this job is because I'm just absolutely passionate about Maine public lands. I've spent a lot of time on almost every public land unit that we own. A lot of it has been at work, bushwhacking, going up and down mountains, through swamps and bogs, and I think we have a world-class resource here. That's kind of that, that double treat of being able to work with something you really like and then know that other people are gonna find that passion that you have and that your coworkers have. I feel lucky to be able to spend my days here working on issues that I think are important to the people of the state of Maine. I feel lucky to interact with the public when we're out here, you know, people wave us down and stop us and ask us what we're doing and to be able to explain what we're doing for the resources, it's just really rewarding and, and I feel lucky to be able to do that every day. Having managed these lands for 20 years of my life, every acre is special to me. The, the legacy is the land base, making it much better for those coming behind us. That's, uh, that's really rewarding.